So here we are, folks. Interview number one with Holly Shorts. I have yet to get to LA because we know that's happening next week. So I have the good fortune of screening and interviewing ahead of time before getting to LA. My very first interview will probably be one of my favorites. I can tell already because she's very bright and she is very accomplished and she's very young and she knows what she's doing. This lovely young lady's name is Elizabeth Acevedo. She has a beautiful piece by the name of Mirage that is playing today, as a matter of fact, at Holly Shorts, 5 p.m. Pacific time today. Thank you, Elizabeth, for doing this. Right out of the gate, I want to ask the very first question because you're in Paris right now. So obviously, of course, we all live in a day and age where we've all lived the last trauma for the last two years. And clearly things are now opening back up, et cetera, and all that good stuff. But you're in another country right now. So talk to me a bit about how things are there. And more importantly, why did you choose to have your thesis project done in Paris? Well, Paris right now, I actually haven't experienced many COVID restrictions, if any at all. I just produced a short film for school, which is sort of my thesis. And for that, we just had to work with actors that all had to prove they were vaccinated. If you're curious about what the landscape is here with vaccinations. But for the most part, it feels like everything is pretty much back to normal. And this is actually my last semester at NYU at all. And I had to sacrifice my year abroad that I had been planning on doing because of COVID. And so I I was so, so lucky to be able to fit in this one month overseas. And NYU has this program based in Paris where you make one experimental film in the course of four weeks. And it just felt like a dream to be able to do that. I feel really lucky. We wrapped just about 48 hours ago. So, So I'm fresh from the shoot. That's exciting. Oh my gosh. Do I dare ask you to give us just a hint about what the movie centers around? Can you say anything at all? Sure. I'll say that I saw these two people saying quite a teary-eyed goodbye on a park bench. And then I saw an older woman watching them. And then when the couple had left, she went to sit down on that bench and it looked like she said a little prayer. And so I started to imagine these three characters, this woman who was reminiscing about her youth and wanting love and this couple saying goodbye and the whole film came out of that and we're about to start editing it. How exciting is that? Now you mentioned NYU and I know you go to NYU Tisch School of the Arts with a bachelor's in film, TV and creative writing. So talk to me a bit about that. A lot of the people that I've interviewed, ironically, including my partner, went to Fordham University. So I'm curious as to the choice for NYU Tisch. And more importantly, tell me one little tidbit that you would advise individuals who are looking at getting into film. Would you recommend, because some filmmakers are the belief that set life is all that there is, meaning you can jump from here to here without having a formal education. So where do you stand on that? The film school or no film school, big question. I can get into that. So for me, I started at Johns Hopkins University, which couldn't be more different than NYU. Johns Hopkins is mostly medicine. And at first I thought I might want to go into neuroscience, but I was also majoring in creative writing over there. So I just knew that I was interested in the brain and storytelling. And I didn't know how that would fit in yet, but I early, I did ED. So by the time I got to Johns Hopkins, I already knew my life has to be about film. This is what I'm in love with. So the second I landed over there, I was already applying out and being born and raised New Yorker and loving that city, loving the hustle over there. I wanted to make movies in the independent industry. And so NYU is kind of the top place to go for that. So that's why I chose NYU. And I ended up having to go into quarantine it felt like the second I got to NYU okay. I was just one semester so it feels like I spent two years behind my computer screen at film school so I don't have the classic experience with it but I don't regret that at all I think for me it actually worked out really well because being over zoom it allowed me to actually make Mirage I don't think I would have been able to make that film if I wasn't over zoom because I had this flexibility that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And I was just sure. so, I was so hungry to make something because we were all just on our couches that that's what I did in quarantine. And you asked about whether or not film school is a good idea. And I think for me, it was both a con and a pro. 
so far I've made films with school and I've made films a film on my own and I definitely prefer making a film on my own because there aren't any restrictions and you can you can go big you can go small you can design your own timeline uh films with school there there's another layer of bureaucracy that you have to deal with that sort of doesn't exist the same way in the actual industry I I would say though that just having this safe space to make mistakes and not feel like you're tarnishing your reputation in the industry is the big pro of going to film school is just having that bubble to try things out and fail and try again is the value of it and also I mean I've I've met the most amazing people at NY2 who I think I'll probably be making films with maybe for the rest of my life so that's another big pro. That's very, very cool, actually. I did notice in your background that you've also attended the University of Oxford. Now, was that under the same vein in terms of more the science or, or brain side of things, or that was a short-term thing, yes? Yes, that was a summer program. <laughs> Excuse me. Gosh. That was a summer program, and I was actually studying screenwriting while I was there. Okay, gotcha. Got it. So these are some very heavy-duty skills and, and very heavy-duty schools that you're going to, of course. But there's also the school of real life, of course. And now you've been on the set and you're a little bit younger. One thing that I like to ask younger filmmakers is, is there something that you have been taught or told by, let's say, a senior filmmaker or somebody far more versed that you've started to incorporate into your own creations? I would say one habit that I've gotten into, and I really can't remember who told me to do this, but... I now have to do it is the second you wrap a set to spend the next day while everything's fresh, just journaling all the things that you regret or mistakes that happen. Oh, wow. So that you then treat those little mistakes and mishaps that were bound to happen. They always do as lessons rather than things to get you bogged down. And so next time you're on set, you just you have all these extra bits of information and little lessons learned. So I always like to journal after I direct. I reached out to Emma Seligman, who is sort of a star child of NYU right now. She just directed mm-hmm. Shiva Baby and it's doing so well. Yeah. And right as that film and her name was sort of blossoming, I was about to start the process of pre-production for Mirage. And I just wanted some advice, especially from a young woman in the industry because sure. there are so few of us. Um, and she said to me, just be ready to, to sacrifice everything for your film. And if you're ready to do that, then go for it. And hearing that at first, I thought that seemed a little bit dramatic. And then I realized that if you're ready to make this film your life, then you should go for it. I say it's a wonderful addition to your life because it feels like you're almost in a relationship with this very special imaginary thing for a while, but it definitely does overtake things. Uh, I, I'm happy to do that. But then also it comes down to making sure that you have a really good relationship with your producers or whoever you're working with because you really need that team and the team needs to be happy and motivated and inspired for a really long time throughout really difficult situations. So if you can foster good energy among people, I would say that's actually probably the most important thing about making films. Good advice. Very, very good advice. As a matter of fact, I know that you have done photography with National Geographic before, which is quite impressive in and of itself. We all know who National Geographic is. So talk to me a bit about what you see in a photograph versus what you see in a film. I would say the goal, I think, is to make film scenes that are as powerful as good photographs, because photographs they're just a single instant that, if, especially if there are people in the photograph, those moments of single seconds are supposed to encapsulate a whole story or a whole feeling or a mood in or a whole relationship in just a split second. And in films, you want to sustain that story in what's evident in the frame, like rather than just a split second. And so I, I think they're they're very much the same. It's just film is sure. it's an elongated version of of a photograph. 
there are some filmmakers that actually have said before, or I've heard them say actually, that it's best that if you don't have a background in photography, you're going to struggle a little bit more as a filmmaker. Would you concur with that? I think there's a lot of different types of directors and filmmakers because I, I've talked to a lot of cinematographers and just a lot of people in the industry. And I, when I was sort of figuring out who, who I would be as a director on set, and they always say, oh, you can either be someone who's really heavy on the acting and you don't care at all about how the image looks and you leave that up to the DP. And some films, it's not about how it looks. That's not the priority. It's more about the drama. And sometimes it is like cinema du look. It's about the style of it and the vision of it. And sometimes it's about both. Those are great films. But for me, just with my background of photography, I tend to really care about how something looks and just having that background with photography, I think gives me at least the very least the language to be able to talk to the cinematographer really specifically about what I want in each shot and each frame. So for me, I'm heavy duty in, in camera prep and I storyboard mm. every second of every film. <laughs> Storyboarding, that's an interesting concept actually because half the filmmakers that I have interviewed have never done a storyboard ever. Then the others are like yourself where they're pretty insistent upon that sort of thing. Um, would you say it's fair in your opinion the more you storyboard, the easier it is to film. For me, yes, it helps me visualize everything and actually get at the heart of what the scene is dramatically because when you're trying to decide what a shot should be, you have to think about what's the main significance of this moment emotionally and how can I communicate that through the lens? So it helps me think about how I'm gonna direct the actors and vice versa. But also you always have so little time on set to get done what you want to get done. And so having all that prep work ahead of time. And then what I do is I take it a step further and I prioritize the shots. So I know what is necessary and what sure. we can do out so that once I'm on set, I, there's always a moment where my AD comes up to me and says, Elizabeth, or she says, Elizabeth, you need to cut five shots here. And then having that storyboard, I can look at my plan and say, okay, we're going to send these to the graveyard and I'll cry at home tonight, but that has to <laughs> I get it. I do. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I want to talk about is funding. I had read that you had once raised $50,000. Now I know some filmmakers that can do that in a drop of a hat and some that are still trying to come up with the first couple of thousand as far as to doing any kind of film. And we talk a lot about raising money and creative ways to do that, et cetera. I understand that I had read you had once raised $50,000 as far as for filmmaking. And we talk a lot about filmmakers and trying to raise funds and trying to have projects made. And we all know how difficult that is. So talk to me a bit about how you were able to do that and some bit of advice you can give to someone who is just striking out left, right, and sideways as far as making money for film. I have raised money in what feels like every possible way you can at this stage. And I can walk you through all the different ways that I did because there were several and I'm nearing being able to say that I've raised six figures. I haven't pocketed anything, but we're oh, getting that's awesome. Yeah. So it started with a seed and spark, which is similar to a GoFundMe or an Indiegogo. It's just an online platform. Seed and spark is just for film. So if you're going to go that route to any filmmaker listening, I definitely recommend seed and spark because the whole community on it is just people trying to fund films and creative projects as opposed to any other business or company so on that front we spent I think it was a month and a half we had our campaign running and a month before we released it we had been doing prep work for that and on season spark we raised I think it was about $21,000 and it's not like you just hit a button and it's out in the world and the money comes in you have to email 10 fold, 20 fold, maybe 40 fold people that actually end up donating. So you have to be prepared to reach out to your high school professors and your mom's mm. friends, 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 and someone you bumped on the street corner once. So you're, you're emailing everyone and you, you want to make those emails personal. And for that, I would say the more, the more you can have your project fully visualized, the better I had 
a ton of lookbook images. We shot a really small little campaign teaser with edited clips from other films just to give a taste of what the film was going to be because ironically, but it is how it is. People want to see what the product is before it exists, sure. even if, if it's what you're trying to raise money for. So the budget for Mirage was about double that. So we still needed to raise a lot more. And so once we got to see them spark 20K, then I started going out to people privately. And I started to pitch larger amounts. So on Seed and Spark, I was getting, I would say the main amount I was getting was around $250 was like maybe the mean. And then I started going out to people for closer to 3,000 here, 2,000 here, just a couple grand, a couple grand. And I, I started to reach out to lawyers to see how to write a prospectus. And I started madly researching what financiers receive when you're trying to raise money for hundreds of millions of dollars for a film, just because I started to want to do things the proper way, even on a micro scale. So I started pitching people who are more deep pocket investors compared to my Seed and Spark people. They were still pretty young, but then my friend was working at a restaurant and she was the hostess and it was a very nice restaurant on the Upper East Side of New York. And she started running a little scheme with me where she would text me every time she thought someone might be a good fit to pitch at this restaurant. And I would stop oh everything I was doing. I would put on a suit, put on a pair of heels and I would run over to this restaurant and just slide in at the bar and strike up a conversation and end up pitching people. And it was going nowhere. And then one day I just came by to visit her, not for pitching sake. And this, we started listening to a man have a conversation with someone at a phone across the bar. And he was talking about neurology and film investing. And my film, Mirage, there's a lot of psychological elements to it. Yeah. And I could hardly believe my ears. So of course I went over to speak to him and he turned out to be an incredibly generous, incredibly nice, smart man who had a really personal connection to the material that I had written about. And so I took him to coffee the next day. I finally pitched him and he closed the funding for my film. Wow. And he was there to support us when we needed more funds uh, for post-production. So it's, it's a fluke, not really. I would say if you can find someone that's that believes in you and believes in your material and has a personal connection and who is generous and has the means mm. to then that that's like the real key to making your first projects because it's not like you can promise a return on your first right. short film that's absolutely that's a real fluke and then since then I really wanted to just build my skills of cold pitching people so anytime I was at dinner with a nice group of people anytime I was at an event I was lucky enough to go to some film festivals with Mirage for my future projects I've, I've been pitching ever since so it's it's just a it's just a state of mind I think you just you have your tentacles and ears and sensors out anytime you're out and about and you never know where you're going to find funding oh absolutely you bet. We talk about that a lot on the PR side of things. As far as you never know who you're networking with, you never realize that the person sitting across the table or an interview you're doing or a person that you meet through so and so could be your next anything. So never yeah. take for granted that the person you're with couldn't help you because there's mm -hmm. always an outlet. I, I truly believe that. And then as if she wasn't wonderful enough, not only did she intern with CAA, but now I see you are mentoring with the Academy. Holy bananas. That's mm -hmm. a pretty cool thing, isn't it? I have to ask, uh, I mean, it seems pretty obvious, but it's not. I mean, why intern or mentor with either or? You know, I mean, obviously that's like going from one pool to another pool, even though we try to make them very similar, indie over here and Hollywood over here. Mm -hmm. It's hard to merge the both of them. Um, so why the interest in that? And more importantly, interning with CAA, I've heard a lot of things about CAA. So tell me a bit about that and, and what your experiences were like working with them. So like I said earlier, my first wish was to be a part of the independent filmmaking yeah. world. And while 
I still love the spirit over there. It was actually while I was interning at a production company called Rideback Ranch, mm-hmm. where they blockbusters. That's where I began to be interested in the other side of things out in LA and the structure that goes into um, that pre-production and production process. Obviously there are more resources. It's a completely different model, but there's something about the structure of it that's very appealing rather than the total guerrilla style that the independent filmmaking world has. So I just think that when you're young, it's a good idea to know as as you can and even if your your heart is set in one area it's good to understand the other side so that's why I started to intern and work at a lot of places that were out in LA and more involved in the studio side of things even if I wasn't working at actual studios Mm -hmm. and because it was the pandemic I actually worked for all of those companies over zoom while I was oh my gosh making independent film so I haven't been over there much, but CAA, the people were very nice. I was over Zoom, so, and a lot of phone calls. So it was really project-based. Every single intern was doing something else. All of it was confidential, but over there, I, it was a really good experience to know what essentially the hub of the entire industry is like. Sure. They're at the center and the agencies it's really just an information hub and they they know everything they see everything and they pull the strings on everything so that it was amazing to see and be a part of briefly gotcha you betcha and now the mentorship uh, the mentorship i should say with the academy has just started right or no so that, that one started in early july of last year so last summer was quite a busy summer because I was, I was making Mirage, I was at CA, and it was the Academy mentorship. Sure. So last year they had seminars with basically the creme de la creme of every little stage of production. We had editors, special effects designers, composers, just everyone. And they just came to speak to us over Zoom. Other were, in another time, it would have been in person. And then following the summer term, they ended up pairing each of the mentees with a mentor that they believed would be a good fit to have some sort of relationship with for uh, the following year. And all of the mentors were people in the academy and they ranged from agents to producers to, I don't know if there were any directors, but there are there are definitely writers. It's just a ton of different people in the academy that they, that after getting to know us felt like we were a good fit for. And I feel like I totally lucked out because I have an amazing mentor. He's an executive producer named Mark Baradian. Okay. Yeah, that goes on for a year slash indefinitely. Very nice. So you've got yourself a nice buildup in indie and in Hollywood. My gosh, he's already ready to be like another Steven Spielberg, only female or something. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think <laughs> of like a super, super, I mean, I, it's sad that I have to think about that. Like, hmm, who's a really popular female director? There's something very wrong with that statement, isn't there? Mirage. So I have questions about Mirage. I understand that it premiered at Cannes and not everybody gets to do that. I was just at Tribeca recently and I'm not going to lie. Not that I'm not a Cannes fan. I mean, I'm just a sucker for Tribeca. I feel like Tribeca has a has a good blend of independent and Hollywood, which is exciting to be able to see, of course. Um, And Cannes is a very different uh, audience and a very Mm -hmm. different festival. So I imagine that that was probably an oh my God moment, or or I guess, you know, getting into Cannes isn't as easy as some people might think. So were you surprised? Were you stunned? Were you shocked? I mean, what was the reaction? It definitely came as a a total surprise. I was extremely happy, especially because we were racing again time to finish Mirage just so we could submit to Khan. Right. That was the main deadline. So we submitted on the very last day that you could because we were editing up until the 11th hour. Oh, that. sure. So it meant the world to be able to go. And I remember when I was pivoting my entire life for film and I was leaving Johns Hopkins, I actually saved up to go to con by myself I didn't have a film there I hadn't made anything yet but it was sort of like a a visualization moment to just be a part of the world for a moment and feel okay is this is this what I want is this where I belong could I and just 
visualizing my future there. So then to be able to make something and then go again in, with such a different experience was so rewarding. So upon doing the screening there, how successful was it? How do you feel audience embraced the film as a whole? So the screening over in Cannes is a little different because it, when you're there in the short film corner, you're a small fish in a big pond. So to answer your other question, that's definitely why I'm really excited about hopefully the opportunity to be premiering at other festivals too, because Cannes being the top of the top, you have you have Top Gun premiering at the same time. And so that's sure that the audiences are gravitating towards. But for me, I was able to meet incredible independent producers that just through spending um, time with them at events and them sort of taking me under their wing for 10 days and just talking at me and telling me everything they knew about the industry, it was like a masterclass. And I feel like I've met producers over at Khan that I'm going to be working with. Um, fingers. Yep. So I, I think that's the real value of going to that kind of place at this stage in your career and Absolutely. Meeting, meeting sales agents if you can too. It's just really about meeting people. I think like we were talking about earlier with Holly Shorts, that's something probably if I were to go next year or something, it would be where you meet people your own age that are making films to find your own community to rise up so every festival has its pros and cons absolutely without a doubt you bet now two things about this film i know it was filmed in la and i also read that it's a proof of concept short which i did not know i didn't realize that um so i want to ask you're a new yorker so Mm -hmm. i'm always like doesn't everyone just shoot all their films in new york for obvious reasons you know of course i'm also a very pro New York and anti LA kind of person. So I'm like, okay, so curious to ask why the choice to do it in LA. And of course, um, as far as the proof of concept goes, what's the ultimate goal? Is it a feature film? Is it a television series? Cause I did think about that as well, or some kind of a series. Deciding where we were gonna shoot it started out as really just a practical decision because in an earlier drafted script, there's still that that road scene in the car which takes place in Malibu but originally in the script it was in the desert and there's also the ocean in the script and there's very few places where you can get both a desert a city and a beach in driving distance it was just logical for us to go over there and at the same time also most no I'm gonna not say that but a lot of great talent is in um, California and you don't have to fly them out. Um, so I was really lucky to work with the people that I worked with, um, the actors. And so that also was a driving force in that decision. And in retrospect or giving advice to anyone who might be listening, I would say, if you can shoot your first film on your own turf, do that because while we managed and while it was so much fun, I, I think you save a lot of time and a lot of money just working in a place that you feel familiar with. Sure. So we had to put in a little bit more time and effort into managing that production because we were New Yorkers. Sure, absolutely. Is it your intention to just continue on to do a feature or are you going to break it up into a series? So I am a movie girl. I'm, I'm not ever burning any bridges, but I think what I'm most passionate about right now is films. I would be open to working in series, but I definitely see myself revisiting Mirage as a film down the line. I think it's something that I, I don't feel is right to be my first feature right now, just because I spent the past year and a half, two years in this world. And I'm really excited about some other worlds that I'm building right now. So once I get even more experience under my belt, hopefully more finances under my belt, Mm -hmm. then I would love to revisit Mirage because as you might've noticed, it's a pretty high concept short film and there's just so much to chew on. There's, I have so many ideas for other characters that might be dealing with addictions to nostalgia and there's just a lot to build out in the world. So I'm excited to get there down the line, but it's, I'm not immediately jumping on that feature right now. Okay, I've got you. Now, before we talk about the the backbone of the entire film in general, I want to mention that it is your directorial debut. 
So a question relative to that. I normally will ask a director, hmm, what did you learn about this that you wouldn't do again? But in this particular case, what I want to ask is, is are there particular things on the director's side of thing that you're particularly proud of, meaning a hurdle or something that you were able to accomplish that you didn't think you could directorially? I think that having an image, a vision of what Mirage would be and look like and and feel like in my mind for almost a year preparation and then looking back and seeing that it looks and feels the way I had envisioned was really rewarding because it told me that I can execute the ideas in my head and so I think that was the the biggest reaffirming thing that I saw happen with Mirage and I would also say that beyond directing, I'm very proud of the producing that went into that because there's so, so much work that goes into being able to just do the creative stuff when you get on set and not stopping and getting there and then finishing, just the act of finishing was so, so rewarding. Sure, I imagine so. Okay, so to start off with the film itself, I have to say that my favorite person was the dealer. Oh, I get a kick out of her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I had to ask, not that all the other stars aren't brilliant, obviously, but where did you find that girl? And not only that, I, I really want to know, when you were speaking to her about the role, what was most important about her to stand out? Because obviously we all know who she is, etc. And so some might think that she might be kind of in the shadows, but she's really not, in my opinion. I kind of feel like there's she's representative of a lot more clearly. So how are you mentoring her in terms of when making the movie and how to do her role? Mm -hmm. I searched for the right peaches for a really long time. I was doing casting for months and she, I found on Actors Access, which is oh, nice. just an open platform for anyone to submit and she hasn't done anything huge. So I'm so happy that a lot of people have said, oh my God, that dealer character, she was so amazing because she's, she is, she's so amazing. She had such a brief moment on screen, but mm -hmm. she brought so much life. And she, every time we took a take, she gave it her all. It was so different every time I would give her the tiniest bit of direction and she would change the whole thing and it would just be so magnetic. So I, I hope she's doing some really cool stuff now and I would totally work with her again. And we didn't have much time for her and I to rehearse because mm -hmm. I cast pretty close to a set. And like I said, I was lucky in that she really adapted to very minimal direction on set. But that character overall, I would say she sort of represents any temptation to, to do something unconventional and out of our daily routines for Adam who has been in one relationship almost his whole life she's she represents anything that is other and possible being that she's a dealer of nostalgia she's sort of like this imaginary like ultimate femme fatale anything that that lures you okay so Speaking of nostalgia, now I understand that this film in general is nostalgic to you. Obviously, there's a personal connection there. And we talk a lot about that, at least I do on my on my show. And, and when I interview people, I find it is much harder when something is closer to me to do anything about it, whether it's write about it, talk about it, etc. But I have to believe that a lot of what you have felt, experienced, agonized over has gone into this film, it would appear. Would that be correct? Yes, I would say... If you were able to, I've spoken a lot, I think online about where the inspiration for this film has come from, but what it just made it so much more of a meaningful and powerful experience for me because it turned so many different aspects of my real life into this one artistic product. And to be able to turn your own life into something fictional and tangible and shareable I personally feel like is one of the most magical, important reasons that I'm doing what I'm doing because having that personal connection to the material that I'm writing is what makes me wanna make the movie at all. And a lot of the things that went into this film, just the meanings behind what was in the story for me personally, I think maybe 
might have been difficult to share or maybe the people that were involved, it was difficult to see. But I think just being able to make art out of anything difficult is, is one of the most important things about it. And that's so rambly, but it's, I mean, it's nope. so out to me. <laughs> no, I get it. I totally understand that. I do. I want to say before we talk about the seams behind this, the two actors. One of the things that I noticed for the males and the females is there is, there's always this feeling of going forward, going backward, going forward, going backward. And not every actor can pull that off. And I imagine that you pick both of them simply because they have that range or diversity to be able to go from one universe to another, so to speak. So talk to me a bit about the process of uh, working with the both of them. And I have to also ask if you ever considered having Peaches be the lead. Sorry, I don't mean to get fixated on her, but I, I did consider that. That is a very interesting idea. I have written one and a half drafts of the feature of Mirage mm. and the character of Peaches, who she became in the feature, there was a lot more to her being restricted to just a um, 15 minute length. There's right. only space you can go into. And I was already dealing with sort of two main characters. So we didn't, we didn't have the space to go into her, but I, like you, were very fascinated by her and she has her own story. (laughs) Yes. Oh, absolutely. You betcha. And I find that the leads, both of them, for instance, so you have a lot of darkness that goes on in here, not all dark because, and I don't want to get too much into the story itself because then I'll be giving the story away and folks will want to see it. But, you know, I, I see a love story. I see a story of hate, regrets disappointment, depression. I mean, you have about 75 themes in this movie, I'm not gonna lie. The one that struck me most was there's this continued almost cloud of toxicity. Mm-hmm. It's almost like knowing it's gonna be bad for you, knowing the end result's gonna suck, but you're mm-hmm. just gonna keep going right back into that exact same hole that you're in. And, and I get this sense. And on the other side of the fence, you do feel this inner depth their love seems to continue to grow while the toxicity grows with it. At least that's my interpretation of it. That's my feel, but you're the creator. So in your mind, what predominant theme did you want to have running through the course of their relationship? What did you want us as the audience to see? Mm -hmm. I wanted to express the cyclical nature of being addicted to a bad situation. And I've, been tangentially involved or how should I put this I have been exposed to the world of serious addiction before so I understood that tendency when it's actually hooked to a drug and I've also experienced that addiction to toxic relationships in the emotional sense and so I wanted to use addiction itself as the premise or something tangible to actually talk about what it's like to be hooked to a toxic relationship because it's so hard it's so hard to show what that's like because it's it's so abstract it's completely illogical it's so cyclical it's hard to justify if you put something to it like this imaginary drug the same way that addicts are addicted to a drug it starts to make sense the way people can be addicted to their own relationships with people and especially to the past. And for me, I mean, I was at a stage where I was, I was exiting my teenage years and entering, I guess, the beginning of adulthood and just generally feeling a little bit nostalgic for that free spirited youth. Um, So I had a little bit of nostalgia going in me. I'm not not in a huge way but my father at the same time is he's much older and he's an extremely nostalgic person who I would say is completely addicted to my mother um, even though they have been apart for many years so I was just looking for a way to talk about this addiction to the past and I, I felt like doing that through a physical drug was it made the most sense to me gotcha I have to ask, it almost seemed logical, and I understand the the want or the need to name this film Mirage, but in my mind, I kept thinking, nostalgia, for some reason, why isn't this named nostalgia? It was. Ah. It was, um, and for 
copyright reasons. <laughs> it couldn't be nostalgia. So I agree with you. I wish I could call it nostalgia too. <laughs> it, it just seemed more fitting it, you know what I mean? Because obviously that's what it all keeps going back to all of the time. There's that predominant thing that's overlying there. So it's like, okay, um, because I don't want to give too much away, creator, please give me three sentences to describe your film. Mirage follows a couple that has been together too long and they're now addicted to their own past, hooked to a drug called nostalgia that induces memories. And what they don't know is that they're each having affairs with other people. So when they find out they're having affairs with other people, they decide to get clean from their dirty past and try to make a future together, but they take things too far. And you're gonna have to watch to see what you happens. Bet. One mm-hmm. would almost say that it really is a dark drama in a lot of ways. You know, mm-hmm. there there is some light that's in there, et cetera. But it, it, like I said, the overtones are very dark. They're very dismal. They're very detrimental to both of them. And and there is a lot of trauma, really. I mean, I do. I see two people that are traumatized r- literally over and over and over again. In some ways, when I watched that, I said to myself, my gosh, it's as if you made a movie about grief and you just didn't realize it because that's pretty much what, grief is when we lose our loved ones you just relive it over and over and over in different ways each day but that's kind of the same way as far as that goes um would it be fair to say that you could have done the same film with a father and a daughter because that occurred to me too yeah I think there are so many different archetypes that where nostalgia is really prevalent in those relationships I my like I said my father almost made his his way into being a character himself and that's something I'm definitely interested in exploring in the future so yeah that's definitely fair to say (laughs) very nice absolutely so as far as as of today any wins or nominations yet because I don't think I could find that I did look but I don't think I've seen any so I I'm worried about misspeaking but I'm pretty sure that Mirage is nominated for cinematography in Holly Schultz they're all files so how it works is they're filed under different categories. Okay. Um, so they're filed under cinematography. And I'm very happy about that. Um, Corey, Corey Waters was our incredible cinematographer and I couldn't have done it without him. Oh, there absolutely. Of, I, I would say like creating the cinematography and the look for this film is a, a huge part of that process. So Oh, I, I concur. Absolutely, without a doubt. Some of, the, some of the scenes and the pictures and the way that it was shot, it, very, very, very top top shelf absolutely impressive now outside of today if somebody is not in holly shorts where can they see the film next Uh, they can't (laughs) no more screenings nowhere else there will be but the the sad part about being in the festival circuit is that you can't release it online until absolutely it has its proper premiere so we the first festival we submitted to was early march so we will hit one year of submitting to festivals in March. In March, okay. When I can, I'm just publishing it online, but there's a chance if distribution picks it up earlier Mm -hmm. and they distribute it anywhere earlier, that's possible. But if you ever attend any of the festivals or have any of the online screening or attend any of the online screenings that we have, Holly Shorts has one too, then you will see it. Look at that. Now I'm going to read off a bunch of different places where you can meet this lovely young lady here. And again, her name is Elizabeth Acevedo, and that's spelled A-C-E-V-E-D-O. And these are the places I found her. Her website is Elizabeth, A-C-E-V-E-D-O.com. She is on Instagram, and that handle is E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-S-Q-U-E. And also the film itself is on Instagram, which is Mirage.movie. She is on IMDb, YouTube and LinkedIn. Anywhere else? I will be transitioning over to a Vimeo, but it will be in a little bit. So I'll let ah, you know. I kind of figured that, of course. And before I forget, do I want to talk about uh, the status of pearl extraction? What's the status of that? Um, exciting status. I just got the first cut of it. Just ah. So we'll be editing that until uh, September 5th we've given ourselves a hard deadline because we really want to see okay sure so i'm just editing it right now we're still raising three thousand dollars and once we have that we're good to go 
And then I'm currently editing my third short and I'll be writing my first feature this fall. Oh, how exciting. So if somebody wants to give you $3,000, what would be the best way to do that? Do you have an online campaign? We don't have an online campaign running. I might be releasing one soon, but on my website, you can find my email, my phone number, everything. And so we can talk directly about that. And we'd also have a, an open Venmo right now at Pearl Extraction. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Anything else? Elizabeth, thank you so much for the time that you gave me. This has been absolutely wonderful. And it's very encouraging and inspiring to see a younger generation do so well. I mean, just not only in the circuit, but write well, direct well, have a good sense of making good films. It's very impressive. You should be very proud of yourself. It's very sweet of you. Thank you.